you know, semiconductor devices, examples of things that I can cover again and show uh, the electromagnetic fundamentals uh, at work. Here's an example. All right? Can spend a few minutes on that. They understand the PN junction, they've seen it in their electronics course, but I can show them, I can develop with them the equations and I can show them again, you know, uh, how the integration and differentiation and all these things work and the relationship between charge and field and, and potential. Again, I can develop the physical and the math models. Obviously, you heard me say integrate math and physics. But before I show you uh, examples of integration of math and physics, I'm going to emphasize, you know, what is math and what is physics. I give the analogy. Math is like the culture and physics is, uh, I'm sorry, the opposite. <laughs> physics is like the culture and math is the language. Math is language of expression. We express physical things by equations, right? So. Can we appreciate one side without the other? I walk here in Morocco, I understand the culture to some extent, and I'm not good at the language. There is a language barrier. There is a barrier right away. It's not just a language barrier, it's a barrier. And the opposite, if I understand the language very well, I brought books and I read them and I understand the language and I have no idea and I can just shoot my mouth off and offend someone, right? So we really need both understanding the language and the physics, the language and the culture, gives us the ability to do successful com uh, communication. Here's an example. And here's another example, all right? They understand each other language and they understand each other culture, they can communicate. Uh, math preparation is obviously one of the problems that we all struggle with. So before I assume that they have all the math that I need, I have to appreciate where they stand on math. I have to appreciate that low math skill is like talking slang. You can't express yourself very well, right? You, you, you have this idea in mind and your words are not coming out. And obviously, people would be pulling their hair out, right? Well, if you really appreciate math, all right, like a lawyer appreciates a language and knows exactly what to say and when to say. I'm not going to say a politician here, okay? Or a poet. Another example is, is a poet, you know. Words come out like a symphony, right? Here's an example. He's a master at work here, right? He knows how to manipulate all these equations. So where do our students stand in this spectrum here? and we have to talk them on the right level, right? If I just push them through uh, math that they cannot relate to, obviously I'm gonna get the uh, hair pulling uh, situation. Now, like I said, if I'm gonna integrate math and physics, then again, we need to appreciate the relationship. So many people say the physics of math and I question whether it's a math of physics or the physics of math. In fact, you know, you can't separate them. Here's an example. That's math, right? We all know that one here. Anyone can argue with this one? I'm not seeing any hands. Well, here's one, and here's another one. Are they equal? I do that to my students all the time. I do it to my little kids as well. You know, I go home and I challenge my little daughter. I tell her, here's one and here's one. They're not equal. What's going on? Get them to think about the math and the physical insight of that. Well, there is a famous apple of, uh, example of apples and oranges, right? You know, this is a bit more effective than the apples and oranges because we have them all the time. We can do them any time. I don't have to go steal an apple or an orange somewhere. Before I dig more into the math and physics, I want to get the problem solving because I want to 
put them together because they are related. Uh, problem solving. Students typically don't know where to start the problem and how to proceed in it and what they got at the end, they have no idea. But if we give them a systematic approach of thinking, we help them with their problem solving. We told them, start with problem identification, conceptual model, develop a mathematical model, and then convert that to a numeric or a computer model. These are options here, all right? If you need to, when do you do that, okay? All these questions need to be uh, addressed with the students and we tell them that they need some tools to be able to manipulate that. They need coordinate system, they need integrations, they need vectors, they need complex variables, they need sometimes numerical analysis, they need programming, they need all these things to, you know, you can't fix a car with only a hammer and a screwdriver, right? So you, you have to have some tools and we show them which tool to be used what. You know, if you just walk in, uh, in the shop only with one hammer in your pocket, obviously you're gonna make more damage than. So I showed this picture here. I say the physics issue, the physics problem have to be in our background at all times. We can never leave it. Throughout the solution, I have to relate always to the physics. So I start with the physical problem, I con convert or bring out a math model to represent that physical problem. I do my math analysis, I get math result, and very importantly, I interpret this result into uh, physics again. And you see the uh, first arrow is less reddish than the last arrow. The last arrow is the most difficult one. You know, many people can do the middle arrows here, the gray ones, but the first arrow here, you know, few people can do it, but the other one here, many people ignore it. They get the math result and they think we are done. So these are the steps. You need to derive a physically based model first. You need to develop the corresponding mathematical model. You need to do the math analysis and finally translate the math result into relevant explanation of the physical phenomena. And if you don't do that, then I'm not sure which one is the pointer. Is this a pointer here? Okay. Um, I say this is the real world and this is the real world and in between here consider that like a dream world. Someone slept and thought about a solution and woke up and doesn't know what the solution that you have for your issues in your dream, what does it mean real world? You need to go to someone to translate your dream into reality. So unfortunately, most of us are like that. We walk in, give the math problem, Q1, Q2, Q3, find the force between Q1 and Q2, a math problem. Uh, a charge on a sphere, uh, find the potential at a point distance five meters away, a math problem, okay? That's what we train our students to do. That's what we do, all right? We need a bit more than that. So I call myself and others who do that as the EM mathematicians, all right? These are the two important things here that I need and I always tell my students, if we fail to do the thing in between, we can always get a mathematician to help us, all right? We need it, yes, but as an EM person, I have to emphasize these two. All right, so I'm, going f I'm focusing on the latter one here because that's a tougher issue, right? So I'm gonna give, you know, we can talk about this as well, but my presentation is focused on the latter one. And here are some examples of mathematical things that we do and we don't convert to physics. Physical expressions and complex variables. We lo get lots of answers in terms of complex, wh wh what's complex variables? Right? It's not real, it's not physical. Physical expressions, what's that? Again, it's not real, it's not physical. Displacement current in dielectric, uh, traveling and standing waves, uh, phase velocity, I'm, I'm giving you some examples here of things that we get mathematical results 
and we need to translate that into physical insight. So I'll go into some examples. All right? So traveling waves. I show a demonstration like that. All right? Here's my phasor, and that's how my phasor changes, and that's how my wave travels. We have reflections. All right? I show some of these demonstrations. They help. Obviously, I'll talk more than just what I'm saying right now. I'm, I'm sure that we all can add the wording to this. All right? Here's another way to show the phase velocity. Right? I'm just focused on the peak point. Let me show you this one again. All right? I'm just showing the peak point and how that translates into phase velocity. Standing waves. Two phasers are rotating in opposite directions and they superimpose and this is what I get as a result. So again, I show the voltage max and voltage min and, and all these kind of things as a result of the waves interacting with each other. I show also the cases with attenuation, right? It's not going to be always lossless. There is some loss on, uh, in wave propagation, and uh, the phasers will change magnitude as we go on. And that's a mixed wave, right? Here's one to tell them why we're studying transmission line theory. People will say, I know how to do circuit analysis. Why don't I implement that on transmission lines? I'll tell them, look at the size of your piece of wire and how does it relate to the wave that is traveling. And if that piece of wire is 10 degrees versus the 360 degrees wave, you don't get much of potential difference between the two points right here and right there. See, the potential difference is not much. Well, if your piece of wire, for example, is 50 degrees versus 360, you can see the potential difference across your wire. It's just a piece of wire. Before, you assumed that as none. You neglected that. It was the same node. Now we have to see that there are two different nodes, two different potentials. Pictures like that I show, and I don't have to do much convincing. That's why we have to study transmission lines. That's why I have to go through a distributed network analysis. This is a, a tough one, phase velocity. In wave guys, phase velocity is greater than the speed of light. How do you explain that? Okay. So forget this. I'll tell you what exactly I do in the lecture. I say, here are my both fists, all right? I'm having this up and this down. I'm going to oscillate them like this, reciprocate, right? They are doing that. The actual velocity of the motion object is vertical here, right? But if your eyes are only watching the peak, the peak was here now. In less than a fraction of a second, the peak is up here now, all right? Just like magicians, right? Magicians do that without you noticing here. They dim out the room and they play the game and all that, right? So, Look at this, all right? The peak point moved from here to there, and the same time I moved this from here to there, okay? So if I move my arms far away, look at this now. Isn't the peak moving faster now? Disappeared here, showed up there. If I have longer arms, all right? My arms go to infinity, I can give you an infinite phase velocity. So here's a mathematical analysis for those of whom would like to have a documentation of this mental picture here. And I do the same thing, and I explain it. And I show them here's the, the particle velocity is 2h over the time tau, while the oscillation or the phase velocity is the separation distance over the same time tau. And I can make d as big as I want, and I can make the phase velocity much bigger than anything you can imagine even bigger than the speed of light, all right? And that's exactly what happens with waves. We are only monitoring the peak point and the phase velocity as a result 
arms. Disappeared here, showed up there. If I have longer arms, all right, my arms go to infinity, I can give you an infinite phase velocity. All right. So here's a mathematical analysis for those of whom would like to have a documentation of this mental picture here. And I do the same thing, and I explain it. And I show them here's the, the particle velocity is 2h over the time tau, while the oscillation or the phase velocity is the separation distance over the same time tau. And I can make d as big as I want, and I can make the phase velocity much bigger than anything you can imagine, even bigger than the speed of light. All right? And that's exactly what happens with waves. We are only monitoring the peak point and the phase velocity as a result comes out. This is my favorite part, and you may disagree with it, but let's go through it together. Complex variables and phasors. So what are phasors? We discussed that. Why phasors? What are the alternatives? And then if we are convinced that they are important, then how to use them? So we have to do all these kind of things. It doesn't take much time, by the way. It sounds like I extended the semester into five years, but no. It's just the way you present, the way you talk to the youngsters and how to convince them that these things are important. Ah, we all present it that way. We say a phasor is a representation of a harmonic motion here. So if you picture that uh, phasor A at an angle phi, it's just like a sinusoid here or a cosine so to be more accurate, with a certain phase phi. And here's the equation here. So I take an a cosine omega t plus phi, and I represent it as a phasor a. So I write it as a magnitude of a and an angle of omega t plus phi, right? We do that, and we move on. And guess what? We jump right after that into Euler's formula. All of a sudden, imaginary came in, became complex. What are the roots? Oh, you guys studied complex in high school, right? You know about imaginary numbers. Well, we use them here. Why? No one will dare to ask. Otherwise, they will show their ignorance, right? So, oops. So here it is. Here's Euler formula, and I say the cosine and j sine. Well, I start the lecture usually by asking them what is J. Actually, I start the semester. And I give them that as an assignment and say, go read about it and come back next time with an essay about what is J. And very few would come up with something reasonable. The majority will have no idea about what is J and where did it come from. The physical meaning of a measure number and why do we use complex variables? Many of them will come with this answer here. J squared is minus 1, and therefore J squared is square root of minus 1. OK? Give me 1. No physics. So I say the mystery of J. Here's my cosinusoid. And it's a projection of that phasor as it rotates. But guess what? There is another projection there, too. Now. If you look at this other projection here, does it have any new information that we didn't have in the first one? No. No new information. New, no new knowledge. Can we get rid of it? Sure, get rid of it. But if it is there, we can use it to something good. What's that? I'll show you. OK? I'm going to pack the sine term and the cosine term into a, a package. I'm going to call this package PA. The important part in this package, or the information part in this package, is contained and exists in the, what happened to the, uh, the light is fading away. Uh, the important information is right here. This one here is complementary information that we can use or throw away, no problem. And this pack here that I'm going to use should not harm the separability, the separability 
of the two terms, right? If I'm going to pack the cosine term and sine term in one package, I should be able to maintain the ability to separate and get my cosine term back again, because that's the part that I care about. That's my time domain harmonic motion. So I'm going to do a PA as the cosine part, as the sine part, and scale the, the sine part by a factor of Q. That's a linear combination. And obviously, if I do on a linear combination, I'll never be able to separate them. So to maintain the separability, separ oh, I can't say that word very well, <laughs> the ability to separate, all right, I'm doing a linear combination here, all right, such that I can always see the term that I care about right there. I'm going to write it for short. I'm just going to remove the omega t plus phi as alpha in this expression here. Now, with this kind of a pack here, I have to make sure that the kind of math operations that I go through will not alter this ability to separate. So let's try the typical things that we do, scaling, addition, subtraction, multiplication, differentiation, all these kind of things that we typically do. All right? uh, you can tell. If you go through scaling, you multiply the whole thing by coefficient a, and you do the operation here, and you guess what? You're still able to separate the cosine term from the sine term. Just the coefficient of q is gone. If you are doing addition subtraction, suppose you have a pack of pa and a pack of pb, and again, I add them together, and guess what? I can still separate the useful part from the complementary part. We go to multiplication. Two minutes. That's exactly how much I need. Thank you. <laughs> they, may, they may become three. <laughs> All right. Good timing. The multiplication. Multiplication is a, uh, when you multiply two uh, phasors. Typically, you multiply the magnitudes and you add the angles. So I'm showing again, if I do the multiplication of the two packs, uh, I, should, I should come with this kind of an answer here. Right? So I go do the multiplication and compare my answer all right, to the one with the pack, and I discovered that q squared here has to be a minus 1. So that mixing coefficient has to be q squared uh, equal to minus 1. That q mixing factor here, or mixing coefficient, has to be that way. And, and, and that's basically what we call the j. And some other people call it i. So j squared is minus 1 is my mixing coefficient. All right? And j squared is minus 1 is just like a 1 angle pi, and the square root of that would be square root of magnitude is 1. The square root of the angle would be half of that, so it's a 1 angle pi over 2. And it turns out to be uh, something on that axis, and that gives us back, I'm rushing here through, all right? That gets us back to uh, the, uh, the, the j term is on the vertical axis, and the real term is on the horizontal axis. And, and you can see now. Uh, the, uh, uh, the correlation between the two. All right? I jumped to the Euler formula just to conclude now, but I'm sure that you all relate to all this kind of uh, uh, insight. So, we need fundamentals, foundations, we need integrate math and physics, we need to explain things uh, at the student level, we have to make things efficient and attractive without compromising the EM skill component. Thank you.